Hello all. This is the second session in the sequence of webinars done for the Enterprise Application Performance. I would like to thank all the attendants for the interest shown in this webinar and also thank to my colleagues for supporting me in doing this webinar. Today I will be talking about Enterprise Application Performance using distributed caching. But first let me introduce myself. My name is Tito and I'm a solution architect from OutSystems Experts team. I frequently do architecture and performance analysis of client existing systems and have found that sometimes applications are developed without taking advantage of well-established distributed caching technology that could improve user experience in specific scenarios. As you know, users do not like to wait. So it's important to let them navigate through your applications without having to wait seconds between screen loads. Now let's get into this thing. Some of you might have faced situations where application performance is quite poor. Most of the times, the causes of these performance hurdles are related with the way the application was developed, other times the infrastructure needs to be scaled or upgraded because it's not fit for purpose anymore. In this webinar, we will focus more on how we can mitigate performance hurdles related with application code. Database access is usually pointed as the main culprit, but like queries that behave slowly or code that executes too many accesses to the database. In other situations, it's the data that has grown to a point that was not envisioned during application design or development, and the code was not prepared to handle that amount of data. In other occasions, I've seen that extensions can also or behave slowly, slowly or are being called continuously without any type of control. Also, putting too much data in session or view state can also work for screen load performance since the data has to be sterilized and stored in the database in the case of the session or sent to the browser if it's the view state. So, caching is going to solve all of our problems, right? Well, it would be great if that was the case, but as Phil Carlton once uh, said, doing caching has its own problems like invalidation, and even if it's easy to do it in our systems, one needs to understand which situations pays off and which it doesn't. So, for the people that hasn't yet used the out-of-the-box caching in out systems, it's quite easy to do it, and you simply make use of it to cache queries, actions, web blocks, and screens. You just need to use the cache in minutes attribute to do so as you can see in the, this aggregate here, in this action, in this web block, and also on this screen. Now that we, have, that we need to be, uh, now what we need to be aware is that the cache is an in-memory process that stores data only temporarily from query results, action results, and rendered screen data. This means that the data being stored is going to be stored in the RAM memory using resources from our OutSystems front-end servers. In this way, we need to be careful and analyze the impact of using the local cache. So with all these previous options here, we are using the local cache, which is different from what we will talk later on, which is the distributed cache. Continuing, we need to understand the impact of using the local cache. First of all, the local cache is sharing the front-end server resources, like memory and CPU, with all the other applications that are deployed in that front-end. Another point is that the local cache can have different data amongst the different servers. I mean, the data stored in the local cache is not consistent across different servers. 
because the in-memory process is not synchronizing state. One advantage, though, is that the local cache is entirely managed by the OutSystems platform, and for many scenarios, it's the fastest approach for caching data, because that in-memory process resides in the same front-end hardware. However, there are some drawbacks of using the local cache, like it doesn't allow developers to control entirely the caching validation mechanism. It's quite easy to control invalidation of cache entries in the same front-end server using dummy parameters that have unique values. But this trick does not work to synchronize the local caches amongst the different front-ends in the infrastructure. In addition, the cache loses some of its advantages, and by cache I mean the local cache, when the number of front-end servers start, start to escalate since the front-end server cache might not have any data, hence the first hit in each local front-end cache is only going to be a miss. On top of this, scalability requirements of the local cache can be different from the front-end servers, depending on the type of business and application. To better depict the data consistency problem when using local server caching, imagine this scenario where you have the same application deployed in front-end A and front-end B. In this situation, imagine that the same application is getting um, stock trade prices from the database, right? Imagine then that application instance A retrieves that stock data from the database caches it locally in its own memory process, and then in the meantime, another process changes the data, I mean the stock uh, market uh, quotes in the database, and the application from front end B retrieves that data now from the database and caches it in, in its own memory uh, process memory. What happens is that the application in front end A will have different stock prices than the application in front end B. Even if they are the same application, the cache is not a snapshot of the data in different times. So this is going to be a different version of the data in the application instance A and application instance B because the data was fetched at different points in time and changed during these operations. For many scenarios where data doesn't change often or it is read-only, this is perfectly applicable and doesn't pose any problem. But in situations where business validations or calculations depend on fresh data, the stale data in cache of the front end A can lead to data inconsistency problems. For instance, the trader that was using or watching quote prices would see a different quote price or old quote price from the trader that was connecting to application instance B. This can lead to data inconsistency problems that is usually related with the, uh, with the validation of the data. That's why it's very important to know when cache can be used, and by cache in this case I mean local cache, and when it needs to be invalidated to get a, free of a fresh view of the data. So I hope that you understand uh, the way the problem is described here, so I can introduce how distributed caching is going to help solving these problems. First of all, let's try to see what distributed caching is. Let me explain some of the differences against the local cache. First, a distributed cache stores the data in a dedicated infrastructure, usually, that have servers with the single purpose of being used to store data or cache data. Hence, it does not share resources with the OutSystems front-end servers. This allows the distributed cache infrastructure to scale independently of the OutSystems platform server infrastructure. Secondly, and most important, a distributed cache has mechanisms to keep all cache servers synchronized. 
This means that in any instant of time, the cache state should be the same amongst the different servers in the distributed cache infrastructure. This solves the problem of the data consistency that was described in the previous slide. Third, the distributed cache provides remote access to its data in a transparent way. I mean, the cache client does have any knowledge about the physical topology of the cache cluster. This also means that the data is remotely available to any client besides out systems applications. In addition, this is a technology that is complementary to the out systems built in cache. It is not intended to replace the out systems local cache that I presented to you in the queries, in the screens, actions, and web logs. To better understand this, this picture depicts how a generic distributed cache can be deployed as part of an out systems infrastructure. This is good for you to understand that they need to be set apart. And in this case, applications of, from both out systems front ends connect to a load balancer of the distributed cache infrastructure that is responsible of routing the request to the appropriate cache server. Some popular distributed cache deployments use other sorts of mechanisms to route the request to the right cache server, like smart routing or auto discovery algorithms, which I will not describe as part of this webinar. There are also some sort of cache synchronization process going on between the cache servers, but that depends mainly on the cache provider being used. It's important to note that the load balancer usually for distributed cache infrastructure needs to understand TCP IP sockets, which is usually used to support the cache protocol over it. In order to make the best use of a distributed cache, you have to understand the most used patterns to populate it. One of the most common is the cache aside or on-demand pattern. Using this approach, the application tries first to retrieve the data from the cache. And whenever there's a cache miss, it updates the, the cache with fresh data from the database. There are some caveats with the implementation of this approach. The developer needs to be careful while caching entity record lists, especially with the way entities are exposed by the module. With this approach, it's advised to encapsulate access to exposed entities, making them read only and using actions for read and write operations. The read actions should support record lists that come from cache, depending on the version parameter, and the write actions should update the entities, both in the database and the distributed cache. The caveat is, that exposed entities are still easily used in the UI screens, bypassing the cache for read operations. That's why, that's why it's advisable to not expose the entities as public in the data service CS module. In situations where entity has to be public, you need to be wise about the way they are using UI screens, preferably using the read actions that make use of the cache. In this diagram, the cache connector is the library responsible for implementing the access to the distributed cache infrastructure. And we will talk about later on of a component that implements this library. This pattern is a bit different. This approach is better suited for managing large amounts of data. The background date data push is an approach where a background process or an out systems timer can be used to update the distributed cache on a regular schedule. The consumer application is not to be responsible for updating the cache. In this scenario, it is strongly advised to avoid entity rights outside the background process that updates the cache. When that is not possible, it should be the core services module, in this case, data services underscore CS, 
responsibility to update the cache, but this already overlaps a bit with what the cache aside pattern is. This pattern can be implemented either through an external component outside of OutSystems platform, so basically you would not have this module here called cache sync underscore CS, which includes the background timer, the background process for timer. So in this situation where there's an external component that uh, implements the synchronization of the cache or updates the cache, you don't have this module, and it opens a, a different approach to populate the cache. So you could use, for instance, an external application to update cache da data into the infrastructure outside of out systems application. In order to help you decide which pattern to apply, there's a simple comparison between the different approaches. This should be taken into account as a decision matrix in order to help you decide which pattern applies better. The cache aside on-demand pattern is better suited for data that changes frequently, since it provides better control over what is necessary to cache. This pattern is also a better choice when you need to expose write operations that have to update the cache as well. Regarding the performance, it loses to the background data push, especially in first accesses, right? Since the first request is always a miss in the on-demand approach, whilst the background data push refreshes the cache upfront before the data is required. The size of the data to be cached is also a drawback of using the on-demand pattern, since the cache update operations will be done synchron synchronously and the requests will have to wait for the cache data to be updated, which does not scale very well for big amounts of data. The background data push is not recommended for scenarios where the data changes frequently and should not be used when entity write operations are exposed. However, it is a very good performance-wise approach since there shouldn't be any cache misses. It also allows to cache a very big amount of data because the process is done asynchronously or in the background. All things considered, how can we benefit from distributed cache after all? There are some wins, like the cache data can be accessed from any third party application outside of the uh, OutSystems ecosystem. It doesn't lose state when there's a new application release. However, this can also be a drawback if the structure of the data that is cached changes between releases. A distributed cache also provides statistics about its usage depending on the implementation. For instance, Amazon Elastic Cache has many metrics that can be checked to understand how the cache is being used or the resources that it requires to escalate. You will also get some wins if significant amounts of data are moved from session to the cache, since the session is being saved in the database on every request that needs to change the session, and the cache is controlled by the developer when using distributed cache. Another big win from using a distributed cache is that we can implement a background process that opens up a spectrum of initialization possibilities since now we can store big amounts of data, but we need to be smart about the structure of the data we store and how it is accessed. Another advantage is that it's possible to upgrade the cache server infrastructure independently from the OutSystems platform without any downtime, which is also one of its great features. There are some drawbacks as well. Distributed cache is never going to be faster than the local cache on the same server. But as soon as you start to have more front ends, we will see an increase of its benefits in terms of performance. This slide is just an example of the kind of statistics we can get from a reduced cache that is made available in Azure. In this case, one can inspect the cache hits and misses in this chart here 
the number of gets in stat operations, and how many connections are being used to get the data from the cache, of the distributed cache, of course. All these aspects are important to allow tuning and management of the cache infrastructure, as well as the application code that makes use of it. So, what rules should we base on our decisions to use a distributed cache? A distributed cache should never ever be used if you only have one or two front-end servers, since the benefits don't pay off the hurdles in management and maintaining such distributed cache infrastructure. It's also overkill to use a distributed cache if your applications don't have meaningful database accesses or if your applications are not suffering from any performance issues. You should also avoid using a distributed cache if your organization does not have specialized staff or cannot assign the ownership of maintaining such infrastructure, especially if it's an on-premises distributed cache installation. It is much easier to use cloud services for implementing distributed caches, however. You should also avoid using distributed cache as something to replace out system's local cache function entirely. Don't ever forget that distributed cache is a complementary component and should not be used for all scenarios. On the other side of the coin, you should consider using it if you have multiple front-end servers, ideally more than three, or if you are considering adding more in the future. If you have public-facing web apps, there is a great chance that you have lots of static data that doesn't change often and can be cached using the cache background, that data push pattern. Distributed caches can also be of great use for scenarios where the data that you want to keep is temporary, changes very frequently, or needs to be shared amongst a group of users but it's not necessary to save it to the database, especially when it's not critical data. There are situations where the data has to be stored temporarily and shared with a group of users for a few minutes and then purged when it's no longer necessary, like business calculations, validation results, data coming from external systems, among others. You have to be wise with the data you pick to cache and with the invalidation rules or data freshness that the business demands. There are other scenarios where you cannot simply use the local cache due to the lack of invalidation mechanisms or versioning. When using cache entry versions in distributed cache, it is possible to assure that your code is not updating a stale version of the data that is cached. This opens a broad field of use cases where you can use cache for write operations. It works something very similar as a lock. For data that is not in the scope of the user session and does not need to be saved in the database, the distributed cache might be a good pick to store it, especially if performance is a concern. So there are couple of recommendations you should take into account if you decide to deploy distributed cache. Even after deciding to use a distributed cache, one should follow some deployment recommendations in order to avoid future issues with the existing out systems infrastructure. Your organization should never install the distributed cache services or any sort of distributed cache software in the same out system servers. A different infrastructure, preferably dedicated, should be used for the distributed cache. If in the cloud, there are many services that are available providing almost an out-of-the-box experience with minimal configuration like the Amazon Elastic Cache. This kind of service can sit in the same Amazon Cloud VPC. This might require some customizations for clients and needs to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case scenario by OutSystems. Also, when moving your data to a distributed cache, you should plan for the necessary memory, taking into account the business data that is going to be cached. 
the server CPU should be based on the number of connections you expect to the cache servers, requests per second, number of reads and writes, and size of the cache data. It is good practice to keep the distributed cache servers in the same network as the OutSystems front-end servers to avoid additional ops, firewalls, or proxies in between, which can add latency and affect performance while assessing cache data. There are some additional considerations that should be taken into account when managing a distributed cache in your system. For instance, data remains cached even after an application release or when an OutSystems front-end server restarts. In this way, it is recommended to, pur to purge cache data whenever there's a release in OutSystems applications to make sure that the data model changes will not lead to runtime errors and avoid unpleasant surprises. The distributed cache is not managed by the OutSystems platform. However, it is possible to create a timer with the management script or even a user interface to deal with this. It is possible to define external initialization processes to load or initialize data in the distributed cache by means of an external application, uh, a Windows service, or something similar. You need to be perfectly aware of the locking mechanisms amongst different cache implementations because each provider has its own mechanisms. For instance, Redis is completely different than Memcached. Distributed caching resources are not monitored by any autism's monitoring application. However, it is possible to develop plugins for lifetime or special dedicated applications for that purpose. All things considered, let me introduce a simple distributed cache connector that was made by the OutSystems Experts team and will be made available in the Forge very soon. It's called DM Cache, and the DM stands for uh, distributed cache, uh, distributed memory, sorry. This is a Forge component that provides some actions to store and read OutSystems data types and record lists and relieves the developer of having to write all the plumbing code to access different distributed cache implementations. It also helps the developer to generate cache entries, cache entry keys based on the set of predefined scopes that avoid key collisions. The way the distributed cache work, works is that it generally the providers use a key value store. So in order to identify a cache entry, you need a, a unique key. And this is what this, this library is doing for you. It is generating unique keys based on a couple of predefined scopes. So for instance, if you use the global scope when you try to use the set operation of the M cache, you'll be able to share data between different OutSystems applications or external systems. If you use the application scope when invoking GET or SET operation, the cache entry key is generating using a, a URN made with the OutSystems application ID. If you use the session scope, the cache entry key is generated using the session unique ID. This scope might be useful when you want to move data from the session into the distributed cache and you want to isolate it from other sessions. And there's the other one, which we call web request. For this cache entry, the web request ID is used. So you're entirely sure that the entry you are setting on the distributed cache is going to be unique for that web request and different for other web requests because you, the, the ID is unique by web request. These scopes should be used wisely by the developer, depending on how he wants to share the data that is cached. This component is built using a module that provides a group of actions to get, set, flush, remove, 
and query the cache. Under the hood, there is one extension that implements the inner workings and protocol requirements of each, or of each type of distributed cache technology. At the moment, there are two types of distributed cache supported, NAMP cached connectors and reduced connectors. Further along in the future, this will be certainly extended to support more. But only with these two implementations, we can already connect to an, a huge amount of cache, of distributed cache providers, as we will see. These are the distributed cache providers that we support at the moment with only the, those two connectors. So we have support for Memcache, Hookdisk, Couchbase, the Amazon Elastic Cache, and Azure Disk Cache. Since we still have a bit of time, let's see DM cache in action. First, we will set a variable using the DM cache library and a global scope. For the purpose of this demo, I will use an on-premises distributed cache infrastructure. In this case, I'm going to use Redis. Let me open the website to show you. So this is a, a sample application that we've made it, and uh, probably it's going to be um, published into the Forge as well. In this situation here, um, we have four tabs, one for um, putting simple variables like text uh, or strings and integer values in the cache. So. For the primitive values, we have two tabs, one for the editor, another one to view those values. And we have these other two specialized tabs to set and read uh, record lists. What this tab does is generate um, a number of records in the database for a specific table. <clears throat> I have a template that I can set up to just put dummy data in there. What is important to understand from this is these properties that we have here, that in this case are read-only. The cache server is the one that we use to connect to the distributed cache infrastructure. In this case, we use a reduced connection string that was made specifically to support this kind of um, cache servers. The next uh, input that we have here is um, the cache entry key. And this is, you can change it and you can put your own value. This is basically the arguments that you can use when invoking the set operations. The cache is a very specific um, property when using the set operations that only applies to mem cache connectors. It does not apply to the reduced connectors that we're going to use here. The scope that I'm going to use is a global scope. If we have time, I'm also going to show you what happens when we choose the other scopes. So, for the purpose of this webinar, I'm just putting here some information, like this one here. This is a webinar. Thanks all for your time. And I'm going to generate a couple of records, and I'm going to invoke the set value action. Let me try to proceed to the action. All right. Okay. Now, we have the other tab here, which is the record cache view. I'm going to open a new t browser tab to show you. I'm going to do a refresh. And as you can see, I'm using the same cache key that we used for the set uh, operation. So this is the get operation for the same scope. And what happens here is that what you see here is what I've wrote on the other side. I've added an integer to the end of the two fields that are generic, the name and description. And all this stuff was serialized into the distributed cache server. And we got it here again. Now, what I want to show you is what is happening under the hood. So let me try to open the machine that is providing the cache infrastructure um, servers. 
So this is a remote desktop for a Windows machine. And in this situation here, what I have is two Telnet sessions. One for a Redis um, uh, uh, service that is deployed on this machine. And this is the left uh, Telnet session that I, ha I have here. And another one is a memcached service. So basically, we're using this one here at the moment and not the one in the right. So I'm just leave it for later on if we have time. So let's see what is in there at the moment. I'm going to invoke uh, uh, a command for the Redis instance, which is keys. And what this did is ask um, Redis to, to tell me what keys exist in the current um, uh, in memory process. So this is one machine. If we went, if we, if we could go to a different machine and uh, repeat the same operation, and we would see that we already have that key there with the same value. So in order to see the value, if I'm not mistaken, we have to invoke the get operation with exactly the same key, and we will see the entire value that is saved in here. Don't uh, get worried about with these symbols you see here. Basically, this is being saved on a different notation. It's using BSON. Um, so it's sterilizing the out system's record list into BSON in order to be more efficient in the payload that is sent to the distributed cache server. So that's why you see it like this. What's important to, to, to get from here is that all this that is using uh, almost one kilobyte of size in size. So that's important to know. Another thing that is important in here is to understand how the key was generated when you shows or when you picked that, um, that scope of global. So the prefix is always the same, which is URN, and then it's concatenated, concatenated with the scope that we have here and with the specific unique key that you decided to set up. So if I repeat the operation for a different key, and now let's use the session as an example, we're going to put, uh, I don't know, test two, just to make it clear for you. So this is the viewer, let, let me change to the editor. Now I'm going to use the session. I'm not going to use uh, all these records. Just want one record. I'm going to do the set. Let's see if confirm if it's there. I have to pick. This might be a different session, by the way. So I'm not entirely sure if this is going to show up in here. It is the same session. Great. All right. So let's see which keys we have in here. Now we can see that we have a new entry, which uses the session ID. So with this kind of approach, the developer doesn't need to worry about key collision. At least the problem is mitigated for him. He only needs to know that he wants to share something amongst the different operations inside the same session. So for that situation, he has to choose the session scope when he evokes the set operation. If, for instance, imagine that the developer wants to share values or data across the entire application, but it doesn't make sense to share it with other applications. So this could be data that is shared across all the users, all the sessions, all the requests for that specific application. For that purpose, you would choose, for instance, the application, and you would do the set again. So let me go to the and choose application now. And let's put some records, new records, yeah. Okay, and let's see which keys we have here now. So now we can see that there's a new key, which is the application that is concatenated, concatenated with the ID of the application and the cache entry key that you've put as a parameter. So as you can see, this creates unique uh, descriptors of the of the values that are stored. So this facilitates the life of the developer. Well, for now I've shown you how to set a variable of the re record list. Um, we could 
spent much more time doing other tasks. Uh, the cache ed editor in here is the same, but for primitive values, so it's not uh, worth uh, to uh, demonstrate how it works. It's the same principles, but different uh, types for, for it. We could, we could go through the code, but the code is quite simple, honestly. Um, there is another thing that is quite uh, interesting in here is that, for instance, let's do a test with a, a few records. So, for instance, let's see. Um, and I hope I don't I don't uh, break the the distributed cache server machine. So let's see how it, this goes. Let's do test uh, large data, and let's put it in the scope of global to make it easy to read. Let's generate a template with lots of data. This is lots of data to cache in the uh, whatever. And let's generate a couple of records. Uh, let's say uh, 5,000. All right, now let's see if it's there. Large data. Same scope need to be there as well. Large data application global. Okay, so basically we created 5,000 records with the structure of a name, description, with ID, respective ID, and so on. And this took basically 78 milliseconds. So let's see how much that is. Does it have in there? Um, let's invoke the command to get the keys. Uh, so we have uh, the keys called URN global large data, and I missed the underscore for some reason, but now I have to repeat again. Get URN global large data. So this is quite big, as you can see. Uh, it, it has uh, heaps of data goes on and on and on and on. Uh, I hope it ends someday. Um, okay, here it is. So honestly, um, this is over a megabyte in size. Uh, I cannot show to you because it was too much that uh, I don't have enough scroll to get it. But it's, uh, it's over one megabyte of data and it took around 78 milliseconds to get it from the distributed cache. So if you do an operation like this over the database, it will certainly take longer than 78 milliseconds, all right? So this is a good example, but anyway, you should be careful with the amount of data you use in there. Also, <clears throat> when invoking the operation, you can set up the time to leave of the entry that you're putting on, on the cache. So let me see if I can show you the code. <clears throat> So this is the source code of the application we're using. And basically, we're invoking of the, the, the operation set value of the distribute of the DM cache uh, library. So as you can see, this is very similar to other um, uh, uh, components or modules like Ardo.json. You can use the same technique to serialize the record uh, list to the distributed cache. In this example here, I've used uh, uh, 1,200 seconds as, um, as an eviction time. So after this time, the entry will be automatically removed by the distributed cache process. That you can also use, uh, in complement of the evict time seconds, the expiration date time. Right? The CAS is not used by some providers. Uh, in this case, it's only used by the memcache provider, not for this. And in here, you have the scope. So as you can see, you have the scopes that we talked about that you can use. So this is very simple to use it. Um, let me see if I can show you the example of reading the record list. Um, so it should be here the record cache viewer on the get value operation. And here it is. So you have to use the same cache key that you use on the set operation. So this is the input box that I have in here, all right? 
And in here, you have to use exactly the same selected scope. The technique to deserialize a record list is the same as, in, as used in other uh, modules, like other JSON, for instance. So it's exactly the same. This is the way I'm using to measure how much it took the operation. So those 78 milliseconds includes sterilization, deserialization, and the time it took to send the data across uh, over the wire. So it's all these components of the processing time. Another interesting uh, thing that probably many of you will ask, and uh, it's, it's better if I show you, is uh, how can we configure this uh, library? So um, we have here, uh, we can use Service Center, uh, for instance, and what we have here is that we go to the module of the DM cache and we have a site property which is a cache server. And what's important to see here is that we have some sort of connection stream. And this is very important. The prefix is what indicates the technology that is used to connect to the cache servers. So instead of this, you could use something like, like memcached. And this would connect to the memcached service, all right? So this is what makes it different. You can do it at runtime. Actually, I can demonstrate that to you, and let's hope it works uh, for this for the sake of this webinar. So let's see where this is. All right. So let's do it. So as, I, as you can see, the connection string at the moment is pointing to the release instance. So let's change it to the memcache service that we also have in the same. Uh, machine. Let's apply it. All right. It seems that uh, it's changed now. Now let's refresh the viewer. Actually, I prefer to open a new, a new tab. All right. So it's it's open here. So let's go to the record cache editor. Let's create a new key. Let's make it much simple. Let me call it uh, TM1. Let's put it on the global scope as well. Let's create a new different template like uh, I love this webinar. It's so great. Okay, let's generate 10 records then. And let's try it now. Probably it's taking a bit of time. It can even generate an error because it's initializing the socket pool, uh, the socket connection pool to the memcache connector. So basically it gave a timeout and this is usually normal because we changed um, the implementation of the cache in, at runtime. So let's try and execute the, the same operation again. Seems it's giving the same error. Let's see if we can do it. Oh, it's, oh, it's entirely correct. And the problem is my fault. This is even good for the demo. So as you can see, I used the same port. I didn't explain what this is. This is the IP address of the server cache server, of the cache server, and this is the port. And this is the port that I use for the this. So this is the default port for this, not for memcache. I have to change this back to the port used by memcache. So I apologize for this. Now let's see if it works again. I believe it was here. All right, we need to do a refresh again. Okay, now it's probably the correct port. Oh my gosh, I have to write the message again. Not the cache bar. I love this webinar. taking a bit of time as well. Let's see if it works at the second try. It's still using the old connection string, despite the case that I've changed it here. So anyway, the important thing to get from this is that the way you have, uh, you, you can use to configure um, the, the provider, the cache provider, 
and the connection string to the respective cache provided is through a, a site property. So I just I'm going to do a last try to see if this works. I hope I have the right still using the same uh, the same old port. Well, basically what I was going to put is a key in this uh, NAM cache service that we have here sitting next to the release service. So we would see something like um, we could get the keys in the same way. Overall, it would be the same user experience you would see the results coming from here, but since we changed this to a wrong port, I believe that the, the old connection string is still there and it's inside the pool and it's trying uh, first always with, with the wrong connection, so we w would have to invalidate the cache of that eSpace in order to make this work. But still with the, with the old one, I'm going just to try to change the site property again. Let's see. Right for the last time. Actually, let me just open a new window as well. All right, test. Now we're using the same port. Let's hope that the memcache service is working fine. He's still a stubborn guy. All right, so let's leave it uh, like this. You you had the chance to see this working with the release implementation. I apologize for not being able to show you with the memcache implementation. It's basically the same. The only difference is that you would see here the CAS number or version number. So I hope you... Uh, you had good fun in the, in watching this webinar.